Hello and welcome to Next Up, a career development panel for young professionals and students in agricultural and applied economics. My name is Gal Hoffman. I'm the board chair of the Council on Food, Agricultural and Research Economics. And I'm a faculty at Rutgers University. Right now, I'm going to pass this over to CIFRA's communication director, Bobby Apatham. Bobby? Thanks, Gal. Dr. John Newton is the chief economist for the American Farm Bureau Federation, the largest organization of independent farmers in the United States. He manages the Farm Bureau's economics department and coordinates and conducts analyses used for the development and advocacy of Farm Bureau policy in Washington. Before this, he was an agricultural economist for the USDA and an award-winning faculty member at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He holds a PhD from the Ohio State University. Go Buckeyes, Ohio. You know, I think what, what Cynthia uh, hit on uh, very early is, is to follow your passion. I, I agree with that uh, 100%. But before I talk about, uh, you know, how, how did I get here, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what the Farm Bureau does. Uh, American Farm Bureau is the largest uh, general farm organization in the United States. We advocate uh, on behalf of our farmer and rancher members uh, on Capitol Hill and with the administration on issues that are impacting uh, agriculture and, and whether it's uh, challenges with respect to ag labor, uh, farm bills, which we do every five years, or the challenges of today uh, around COVID-19. There's no shortage of, of issues uh, to work on at Farm Bureau. And I think what I like the most about working at American Farm Bureau and being the chief economist is the opportunities uh, to engage with farmers across the country. So uh, for folks that may not be familiar with Farm Bureau, uh, we're what's called a grassroots up organization. And that means uh, of our nearly 6 million members across the country, uh, throughout the year, those members uh, get together in their local county Farm Bureau offices, over 2,000 uh, county Farm Bureaus across, across the country, and they talk about challenges that they're facing uh, in their rural communities, uh, challenges that they're facing at the state level, and then obviously challenges that they're facing uh, at the national level. And they, they review uh, the organization's policy and propose uh, policy modifications or things that we could advocate for. It all starts at the county level, at those local uh, county Farm Bureau meetings. And, and what comes out of those county meetings goes to the state meetings and the members of each state Farm Bureau will convene every year at their convention uh, to debate uh, policy positions and debate uh, our course for the upcoming year. And, and at the conclusion of all of those state meetings, uh, every January, uh, the delegates to the American Farm Bureau, we gather at our annual convention. And, and in a normal year, we bring anywhere between uh, five and 7,000 members to whatever city we happen to be in. Uh, last year, we were in Austin, Texas. Uh, generally, the last three years anyway, we've been uh, privileged to, to host the President of the United States to visit with the Farm Bureau members. Uh, but at the conclusion of that January meeting, uh, our members get together and, and set the course for the organization uh, for the upcoming year. And so we, we debate our policy positions. Uh, if necessary, we adopt new policy provisions. Uh, and then that those policies that we adopt guide the organization through that upcoming year on how we're going to engage uh, with members of Congress, how we're going to engage with USDA, uh, if there's any potential regulatory changes that we'd like to see happen. Uh, anything that we do as an organization, it all starts at those county Farm Bureau meetings. And so uh, it's it's an honor to, to work for those farmers and ranchers. And, and as the chief economist, what, what I'm privileged to do, uh, A, is every time we bring members uh, to Washington, D.C., and in a normal year, we bring uh, 5,000 plus farmers and ranchers through our office, uh, but we help to brief them for their members when they go up to Capitol Hill and visit with their member of Congress. Uh, we help to give them uh, the latest information, uh, market information, policy analysis, uh, so that they're ready when they get to the Hill to talk about the particular issue, uh, whether it's advocating for the passage of USMCA, which we spent a lot of time last year doing, uh, whether it's advocating for uh, an improvement to the Clean Water Act. Uh, we're, we're doing those briefings for the members uh, in preparation for their visits on Capitol Hill or if they're going down 
uh, to USDA. So not only do we brief the members, uh, but we help to uh, inform and, and analyze uh, policies being considered by the delegates across the country. So it's a, a great opportunity to help to uh, be involved in the policy making process of, of this organization uh, from the very beginning. And, and I think what's, uh, what's enjoyable and, and, and something that, that I take pride in is watching something uh, that you're involved with from the very beginning uh, with those farmers, uh, maybe that you visit in their county farm bureau and to actually see uh, something become law or see something changed uh, in the farm bill or, or see a new program be developed uh, because of the work of your members and the work that, that you help them do. So uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, satisfaction uh, knowing that you can be part of uh, change and part of making a difference. And so I'm, I'm extremely privileged and blessed to be in this role uh, at American Farm Bureau uh, Federation. As, a, as an ag economist, uh, working on policy issues, I'd, I'd, I'd give this job probably one of the top three or four jobs uh, in the country in terms of working on ag econ and ag policy issues, just the prestige uh, of the organization. Um, I recently read a book by a former colleague, uh, Jonathan Coppice at the University of Illinois, he talks about the history of farm policy. Uh, and in the opening pages, uh, talks about the influence of a Farm Bureau over a hundred years ago. So to work for this organization uh, and to be in this role is, is a, a, a very rewarding opportunity that I'm honored to be in. So kind of going back a little bit, how did I get here? Uh, you know, I think Cynthia put it best, you know, following your passion. I think uh, what Barbara talked about, doing what you love to do uh, is, is really what got me here. I started uh, working for USDA, uh, you know, about 20 years ago. Uh, out of undergrad, and, and I was working on uh, agricultural issues. I, I had a passion for economics, but I wasn't an economist uh, for USDA, and I knew that I wanted to be an economist. So uh, I went to Ohio State. I did my master's work at Ohio State University. I had the excellent opportunity to have a, a great advisor who had a, a very uh, well-known reputation on policy issues. I uh, spent my time at Ohio State, worked on my PhD, uh, at the Ohio State University. I'm sorry, Barbara, uh, that, you know, Michigan, that's uh, very unfortunate. I didn't know that about you. That, that will certainly change uh, our relationship moving forward and how well we work with uh, Tory and Associates, knowing that you're a Michigan alum uh, and I'm, I'm a Buckeye, but uh, I'll, I'll let that slide for now. But I uh, did my PhD at Ohio State and, and had the opportunity. Uh, a former Buckeye was the Senate Ag Committee Chief Economist. And so uh, was able and privileged to to be detailed to uh, the Senate Ag Committee. And and when I was working on the Senate Ag Committee, I enjoyed working on ag policy issues, but uh, walking through the Capitol building, working on the farm bill, working on ag policy issues, uh, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And I knew that I really wanted to uh, make a career uh, working in, in this space. And so uh, I, when I graduated Ohio State, I, I went to University of Illinois, I was a faculty member there. I worked on market outlook and ag policy issues, uh, and then had an opportunity to come back to Washington, D.C., working for another trade association, uh, working on policy issues. And then uh, American Farm Bureau Federation uh, came knocking. They were looking uh, to replace one of their economists, and I, I joined the team uh, four years ago and, and have had uh, such an enjoyable experience uh, ever since. I think for, for young people thinking about a career uh, working in agriculture, working in ag econ, um, you know, wanting to make a difference. One of the best pieces of advice, and I give this uh, every year when Seafair brings the interns to, to our office in Washington, D.C., uh, the best piece of advice that I can provide folks, uh, and, and again, Cynthia hit on this, is to be a good communicator. Uh, you know, we spend so much time in grad school you know, if you're a, whether you're a master's degree economist or a PhD economist, uh, you spend so much time in the formulas and you write your dissertation and the goal is to, you know, show, uh, do some proof or prove a theory or publish a journal article. And that's, that's very important. But when it comes to advocacy and, and engaging with outside stakeholders, uh, communication's key. And so I've worked probably, you know, for the last decade on being a good communicator, 
uh, trying to take complicated subjects uh, and explaining them in an easy to understand way, whether it's a briefing on Capitol Hill with, with the member of Congress or uh, if you're visiting with uh, you know, a secretary, uh, folks in the administration, being able to communicate something that's very complicated, uh, almost taking it down to a bullet point level. I had a, a former uh, colleague say to me, and I remember this, and, and I tell uh, the, the folks that work on my team the same thing, is uh, explain what you're doing like you're explaining it to a fifth grader or to a family member. And if you can explain a complicated subject like farm policy or crop insurance, uh, such that uh, you know, a family member or a fifth grader can understand it when you're doing a good job being a communicator. So, uh, you know, I think that's the best piece of advice that I can provide to young folks out there uh, is to follow your passion, do what you love, because then it's not work, uh, and work on being a, a good communicator. And I think the last thing I'll, I'll acknowledge, and this touches a little bit on what Phil talked about on how you be a good communicator. Uh, when I joined Farm Bureau four years ago, we would put out you know, policy analysis for our members. Uh, it was delivered in their email. We sent it out a, a couple times a month. And the challenge with that was after we had conducted an analysis and by the time we had sent it to members, uh, whether it was policy analysis or market analysis, uh, in today's world, when everything's available on your cell phone or available on social media, uh, the information was so dated. Uh, and so we, we uh, refabricated uh, our website, and I'll see if I can share my screen here. Okay, showing main screen. Here we are. So we we refabricated our website. If you go to fb.org slash market intel, uh, and we started to put out our policy analysis online. Uh, and it goes out in an, an email to folks that subscribe. Uh, and this helps to deliver information, communicate information very quickly. Uh, to inform our members on, on things that are happening from a policy perspective that they need to be aware of or things that are happening from a market perspective that they need to be uh, aware of. And as Cynthia talked about, they've been working a lot on the coronavirus food assistance program. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, resources on our website uh, identifying uh, how the CFAP program is administered, how the payments have gone out to producers. Uh, we provide, you know, here's one on what opportunities might Kenya provide uh, U.S. agriculture? So we saw the USTR uh, is beginning uh, trade negotiations with Kenya. So how do we inform our members how important the Kenyan market could be for U.S. agriculture? So uh, we do all of these types of, of policy analyses. We put them on our website. Uh, and since we've launched this uh, several years ago, uh, we now have more than a half a million people come to our website and read this content uh, every single year. So it's it's helped to expand, uh, you know, our ability to communicate with our members and also other agricultural industry stakeholders on, on what's happening uh, in agriculture. And uh, one of the things, you know, when Philip talks about the articles and the videos, uh, one of the other things uh, that I've worked hard on is on visuals. Many people are visual learners. They're not exactly a text learner. So how do you provide good visuals so that people understand uh, the information that you're providing to them? So I'll give you an example of a visual uh, here. So here, if you look uh, on the coronavirus uh, payments, this is a map that shows where the payments have gone to producers around the country. And so those type of visuals are a really important, easy way to communicate a message uh, a, a very self-explanatory chart will go a long way uh, if you're briefing somebody on Capitol Hill on a potential policy uh, idea. So in addition to being a good communicator, uh, I've taken a number of classes. I think uh, Edward Tufte uh, does a, an amazing data visualization course that I think uh, any young economist uh, should, should make sure to attend that and learn how to, to visually present uh, data because that can definitely improve uh, your communication skills uh, in, in this particular industry. 